Good morning. Welcome to worship at Down River Church. My name is Linda, and I want to wish you all a very happy Valentine's Day. And please know that God loves you. Let us pray. Beyond our busyness, above the cold winter floor, there is a glory rising born of heaven and reaching out to each one of us. A light that shines through the clouds, an invitation seeking all who we are that transfigures the world. That transforms darkness into hope, that brings life from a cross where old life ends and new life is born. In glory, Jesus meets us here, rising us from depths of the valley to the height of the mountain, carrying the weight of our humanity to the heights of heaven's glory. Let us worship from the mountain and hear again. This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. Our scripture reading this morning is from Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 9, from the Common English Bible. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and brought them up to the top of a very high mountain where they were alone. He was transformed in front of them, and his clothes were amazingly bright, brighter than if they had been bleached white. Elijah and Moses appeared and were talking with Jesus. Peter reacted to all this by saying to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good that we're here. Let's make three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this because he didn't know how to respond, for the three of them were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice spoke from the cloud. This is my son, whom I dearly love. Listen to him. Suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them not to tell anyone what they had seen until after the human one had been risen from the dead. Thank you, Linda. All right, how many have any idea what's up on the screen right now? Well, it, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's called Magic Eye. Are you familiar? Who's familiar with Magic Eye? Raise your hands high. How about at home? Who's familiar with Magic Eye? Okay. And if you look at it, there, you, you're right. There's, it looks like stained glass, and this one is designed that way. There's a lot of different images you can get, and they, they put all these different pieces together, and it creates this collage look. And you can see there's lots of repetition in it, right? And so it's beautiful, and that's what we can see when we first look at it, right? You see what's right in front of you? I see, uh, looks like, you know, there's some people in halos, things like that. But that's not all that's there. If you're not familiar with them, embedded in that picture is a 3D image. So it's there, and if you just look at what's there on the surface, you can't see it, right? But if, if you look at it differently, you actually can. Now, if you're not familiar with Magic Eye, uh, that is a, a company that does these types of images with the 3D, and they're using a method, I'm gonna get a little technical on you, they're using a method that was developed in 1959 by Dr. Uh, Bella Julies. And what he did is he created the first black and white random dot stereograms, that's what this is known as, and it was an experiment to test, here's the word, stereopis, and I know I pronounced that wrong, but that's okay because I'm, I'm not a scientist or a doctor. But what it is is it's the ability to see things in three dimensions. Okay? That's what he was testing. And there's some real technical parts. By using uniform, randomly distributed dots, it eliminates the depth cues that are ingrained in recognizable images. Raise your hand if you have a clue as to what that means. I don't either. 
but I do know this. What it is, essentially it's saying, you see what you see because your mind tells you that's what you see. Got it? Well, over the years, others took his work and changed it and, and advanced it and actually this led to Magic Eye. It's a company where a programmer by the name of Bob Solitsky, he took that and he developed a more sophisticated full color version of the previous work. Now, what, he, what they did is they took 3D modeling imagery and these colorful art techniques and then they came up with this whole new patented approach and it's called Magic Eye. Now, it's an optical illusion, sort of. And what it is, is the goal is you want to look past that image, and they say to look out in the distance, and you will see a 3D image. And it'll pop out at you. And the, if you're at home, or you get home later on, and you want to run this, stop this, stop this image on that, put your nose against the screen, and this is not a joke, okay? I'm not doing this just to get you to stick your nose against your computer screen. <laughs> and then do that and slowly pull back. Because your eyes are sort of crossed when you start and the image will come out. You will get to see it. It's amazing. Now, not everyone can do it, okay? And it's because some of us are challenged to see the 3D image. And there's a lot of different reasons for that. I know one of the reasons, because I can't see them. And this has frustrated me to no end. And come to find out, apparently my left eye is so dominant that I can't see depth properly. I, I can never be a pilot because of that. Did you know that? Because I don't have good depth perception. To put it mildly, I have spent hours, and I mean hours over the years, trying to see what other people can see. I've tried it with my glasses on, I've tried it with my glasses off, I've tried it with my nose against the paper or the screen, pulling it away, I've tried it by putting it out in the distance and putting it up in front of it so I'm looking at the distance. I have tried everything that I can think of. I've tried it at an angle, I've tried it on my side, nothing works. Although recently, for the first time ever, when I backed away, I could actually see depth. But then, my left eye took over and it was gone. We actually owned a book published by Magic Eye that someone gave to me as a gift. Yeah, um, it's no longer in our house. Sue and I were going through some cleaning and I found it and I said, I just can't have this here anymore. And so we donated it and I hope someone's enjoying it. We still own a puzzle that we've never put together that is a magic eye puzzle. So I can guarantee you, just like this morning when I sat in my office with my nose against the screen and tried yet again, I'm not gonna give up that quickly because I really wish I could see the 3D images. I'm missing out on something, right? And my wife, Sue, said she was out of practice, but she doesn't have to do the nose things anymore. She can just stare at it for a minute and go, oh, I see Jesus on the cross. There's two other crosses on each side. Oh, it's the crucifixion. That's the image on the screen, inside. The 3D image is that. So, sometime try to see if you can find it. And it may be better if you print it out. They say that might work better for you. And there's lots of books and things like that out there by Magic Eye that make this a lot of fun if you can see it. And for those of you who are frustrated like me, it's okay. It's all right. We'll get through this and hopefully your results will be better than mine because let's be honest, sometimes it is a challenge to see what's right in front of us, right? I, I'm told, I'm told what the picture is. I just can't see it. Sometimes we have to change our mindset and look at things differently. Now, this is the last Sunday in our series, Jesus, Man of Mystery. We've been going through the Gospel of Mark and we've been focusing on this question, who is this Jesus who wants to keep his identity a secret? Now, Reverend Teresa Cho, who is the co-pastor at St. John's Presbyterian in San Francisco, she wrote the outline for this, and it's published in A Preacher's Guide to Lectionary Sermon Series, Volume 1. 
So if we, could we offer her a bit of applause and let people know that we appreciate her hard work? Now, the first Sunday we saw the reveal, that was Jesus' identity being shared by God after his baptism. So Jesus is baptized. And then in later weeks, uh, we saw the disciples being called in a couple different ways. One was come and see, and the other was follow me. There's ways that people come to Christ. And then the last couple of weeks, we heard more about Jesus' teaching, his healing, his casting out of demons. And through it all, through this entire series, including today, Jesus tries to keep his identity a secret. And if you want to look back at any of those sermons, you can see them online at our website. Now, because we've spent most of our time in Mark's gospel, I offered to people, hey, take this opportunity to read through those 16 fast-paced chapters in Mark and look for those moments where Jesus said, don't tell others about me or be quiet about who I am. And I hope you had a chance to do that. And if you haven't, you still can. Because guess what? The Bible's still there. It hasn't gone anywhere. So you can read Mark anytime. Now, there are other items that may be hidden that others can see that we aren't able to. Now, sometimes it's because our view may be blocked. We may not be able to see what they're seeing. Something's in the way. Or it may be because we have some preconceived notions and our ability to see something is blocked because of what we believe and we already know what we're looking at. Other times it's because we don't have all the information we need to figure it out. And sometimes though, even having all that information, we still don't get there and yet we try. As I looked up definitions of expose, in Webster's online dictionary, I found this definition which fits perfectly for today. It's to make known, to bring to light. Now, sometimes when things are brought to light, it's things that others may not want others to know, right? It may be something private, something secret. They don't want to expose it. They want to keep it hidden. It may be a fault or a crime or something else. Now, there's news programs that that's their goal, right? They do those little promos. Tonight at 6, find out the rest of the story. Things are not as they seem. It's very ominous, isn't it? They usually don't mean it in a good way either. That's what I've discovered. They tend to focus on the negative. And in fact, in 2006 through 2009, there was a PBS program entitled Expose, America's Investigative Reports. And it was focused solely on investigative journalism. Because it was often done to expose the darker side, right? To bring those things to light. It was a lot of times very disheartening. Things that were actually hurt to find out about, but we needed to know about. That's the challenge there. But here's the thing. Sometimes it's about something positive that someone was trying to keep hidden. Something that brings joy to your heart to find out that that person did more than I expected. And see, when we hear things like that, whether it's positive or negative, oftentimes our view may change, right? We may come along and understand it differently. Now, one of the things uh, you notice here, we have the word transfiguration. We'll be talking about that term in a minute. But if you have uh, your program, inside of that is a sermon note sheet in the back, and I offer that as an opportunity to take some notes on today's sermon so you can look back at it later. And uh, if you're worshiping at home, you have the ability to do that by printing it out or just grab a piece of paper and a pen. It's just that easy. Because today's reading, we find it from the middle of Mark's gospel. And what we're finding, it's the true nature of Jesus being exposed, right, coming out. And in the scripture that we heard today, Jesus has taken a break. Right? Jesus needs some time away. He's been, he's been teaching. He's been healing. He's been casting out demons. He's been feeding thousands. And so he takes a small group of his disciples. He takes Peter, James, and John, and they go up a mountain together. Now, Mark does not tell us why they went up this mountain together. Or why only those three? Although you'll find in Scripture, those three tend to be that inner circle 
He has the disciples, but then there's those three, and they seem to be learning a little bit more and going places others don't go. If you turn to the Gospel of Luke, though, you can find that Jesus said, let's go up the mountain to pray. And so he was taking a break, and I invite you to do that sometimes when you're reading a certain passage. Find it in another Gospel. Get some more information, because Mark doesn't give a lot of detail, but you may find more in one of the other Gospels, Luke or Matthew or John. So as they're hiking up the mountain, because if any of you have climbed a mountain, we know there's not always these nice, even trails. There's at least switchbacks. So I got to believe by the time they got up there, they were, you know, pretty exhausted. Well, at least Peter, James, and John were So as they're up there, all of a sudden he was transformed, the he being Jesus, in front of them and his clothes were amazingly bright. Brighter than if they had been bleached white. Now, the word that we may hear for this is transfiguration. And what transfiguration is, it's a change, but it's more than that. It's a change that exalts or glorifies. So can you just see that in your eye, that white light and how bright it is. Because that's the way Matthew puts it in his gospel. If you turn to chapter 17, it says this, his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. White as light. See, Jesus was being exalted and glorified right in front of those three disciples. And yet, when the three disciples see this, that's not their immediate reaction. To put it mildly, they're pretty freaked out. And they're a little bit scared. Jesus then is joined by two other people. And we're told they're Moses and Elijah. And this, I have to believe, only increased Peter, James, and John's anxiety. I imagine they were getting more nervous. And now, if you, if you think about that or look at this picture we can see the scene, can't we? Now, this picture is actually a Russian enamel on gold 19th century depiction of the transfiguration. And you can look and see the different pieces. The disciples are there, as well as Jesus and and Elijah and Moses. The coolest thing about this, it's it's at the Detroit Institute of Arts. It's just up the road. So you can go see that if you would like. But as you look at it and you can just feel that moment, the disciples were terrified. That is the word that Mark uses. And you can just see them frozen, staring. Like, what am I really seeing here? Now, I I always wonder, though, and Mark tells us, I'm guessing Jesus had to tell them who the other two people were because I don't think Moses was standing there holding the Ten Commandments. Yeah, it's me, Moses. I carry these around everywhere I go. <laughs> and so, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things. We, Mark doesn't tell us how they find that out. And he also doesn't tell us what they were talking about. None of the Gospels do. They were just there together. They don't tell us how long the conversation went on, how long this moment lasted. But Mark does tell us that Peter could not keep from interrupting because that's what Peter does. Now, he didn't interrupt them to say, hey, can can I take part in the conversation? That'd be cool. Or or how about I be your scribe so then that way when we get back, we can tell the disciples what you guys talked about. Or maybe I could go get a snack. You know, uh, Detroit's not that far. I'll get a punchki. (laughs) But he doesn't do any of that. Peter, love him. I love Peter. He suggests that they commemorate this moment, that they freeze this moment by building three shrines. So three dwelling places for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah so they can stay up there on the mountain and people can come and worship them there. That's Peter's idea. Now, normally in the Gospels, when Peter makes a statement that may be a little outlandish, or maybe it's true, it's Jesus who points that out to him and compliments him or corrects him. Well, this time, that's not what happens. This time, something bigger happens, and the scene changes again. What happens is this cloud comes over, and they hear a voice. Now, if you think the disciples were scared before, 
Here it is, it's a clear day. You're up on a mountain, things are good. All of a sudden, this cloud covers them. A cloud overshadowed them, and a voice spoke from the cloud, this is my son, whom I dearly love. Listen to him. Here we have God entering the story to expose, to tell who Jesus really is, because it had been hidden. Jesus was trying to keep it hidden, and humans, we really couldn't perceive it. We couldn't recognize it. We knew something was going on, but we weren't sure exactly what. So Peter, John, and James saw what God wanted them to see, the glory of Jesus. See, Jesus was different and is different from anyone else. He's more than those of immense spiritual stature. That's why Moses was there, the law that the Jewish people followed. And why Isaiah, one of the greatest prophets, was there to show that Jesus was unique and his divinity was more than that. He's God's son. Jesus had told demons to be quiet about what he, who he was. He told people he healed, don't tell anyone. See, Mark is constantly emphasizing this hidden characteristic of Jesus that Jesus wants to keep it a secret. But does he really? See, the divinity of Christ is recognizable when it's revealed to them. They can see it. They can understand it. And here we had God telling these three disciples who Jesus really is. And I can tell you, if they weren't listening to Jesus up until that point, I'm guessing listen to him spoken by God is going to make them change their approach and start listening. And yet the story that we heard, as exciting as it is, it doesn't end there. It doesn't just say, there you go, boom, done. No, what happens after God spoke is the next thing the disciples see is Jesus. Only Jesus. No Moses, no Elijah, no bright lights, no cloud. It's just the four of them left up on this mountain. And I just think about that, and at that point, the moment, it had passed, right? But I also have to believe that the fear had passed. They now had a greater understanding. And I think once they started talking about what they saw and heard, that their attitude really changed. They went from fear, I think they got excited. They were really geeked because of what they had learned. And I think once they saw that, they said, we need to go tell others. We got to share this. This is important stuff. God just shared something big with us. And yet, just as they had in the chapter before this, I want you to go back and read this because it talks about Jesus asking the disciples who they say he is. Jesus asked them this, and here's what they say. They say, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah or one of the prophets. But then Jesus turned it and asked them, who do you, who do you say that I am? And Peter, like I said, Peter loves to blurt, he answered, you are the Christ. And again, Jesus told him not to tell anyone. This is just in the last chapter that we could have read. But now they have confirmation from God. So it has to be okay now, right? If God's telling us that this is his son, who we are to be glorifying and listening to, we should be telling other people and we shouldn't have to contain ourselves anymore. And yet, we heard in the scripture, that's not what happens. Jesus actually continues in his pattern and tells them not to talk about it. Until, though, he adds something new here. It's until the human one has risen from the dead. All right, I want you to think about this. You're Peter, James, John. You've just heard from God that Jesus is his son. And you're now being told to keep quiet about it. And what's all this about risen from the dead? What are you talking about? No, I'm, I, no, I don't want to do that. I want to share, because if there's somebody out there thinking about following, this is going to put them over the edge. This will change their mind, and they will start following Christ. How, raise your hand high if that's how you would react. 
You would be excited. You would want to share it with others. But throughout Mark's gospel, Jesus continues in this pattern of silencing others about sharing his true identity. See, early on, even in chapter 1, right after Jesus' baptism, it shared who he is. God says, this is my beloved son and who I am pleased. I love him. And yet here we are in the middle of Mark's gospel and it's still being kept a secret. See, Jesus has told demons and all others, don't tell others about me, about who I really am. And see, sometimes if we look here, the, the mystery could have been solved all the way back at the beginning. Mark tells us the answer. It's right in front of our noses, isn't it? See, what happened on that mountain was not so much a change into something different. It was finally revealing the essence of Jesus. See, Jesus, when Jesus was climbing up the mountain, he was Jesus. When he was at the top of the mountain, he was still Jesus. And when he came back down, he was still Jesus. And today he continues to be God's son. He is still Jesus. See, he's always with us, always present. It's not just a human thing. He is eternal. But as humans, we can only see a part of who Jesus is. We can only see a part of who he is at any given point in time, the part that we're connecting to at that moment. So then, if anyone is in Christ, that person is part of a new creation. The old things have gone away, and look, new things have arrived. When we connect to Jesus, when we see the whole scene, we are a new creation. Because today's scripture was all from the disciples' viewpoint, wasn't it? It was what they saw, what they experienced, what they encountered, and what they were told. At his transfiguration, it wasn't Jesus who was changed. It was just a revelation. It was a sharing of this is who Jesus is. You may not have noticed it before, but now it is clear. And just as Jesus at that moment was surrounded by the past, in Moses and Elijah, and the present, by those three disciples who were with him every day, when we see Jesus, we experience the past and the present. And Jesus will continue to be here in the future because together we are transformed. We are changed when we take that light inside of us and we let others know, come join us on this walk. Follow Jesus with us. Circle back to the one who created us, who loves us, and be one of his followers, one of his disciples. What I've realized through this series is we can never fully understand the mysterious nature of Jesus. We're just not able to do that, and yet we still follow. And we walk in the way of love, and we answer that invitation to come and see. And every time we grow a little bit closer, and we see a little bit more, and we can participate in sharing that with the world. Jesus no longer wants his identity to be kept a secret. He wants us to share with others who he is and what it can mean within our lives as a follower of Jesus. And so I have a challenge for us this week as we enter into Lent. Lent starts this Wednesday with Ash Wednesday, but it's to find a way to be changed, to be transformed, to show our true nature as followers of Christ. And as we enter into Lent, it's a time of repentance, it's a time of fasting, it's a time of preparation for Easter. And we should take this time to spend in self-examination, to spend in reflection. And through that, as we try to we will learn more about the mystery of Jesus. Amen. Please join me in prayer this morning. Jesus, teacher, you share with all of us. May the wisdom of your words pour over all of those in leadership positions in this world, in our lives, that we may live out the teachings that you brought. Jesus, healer, 
Your touch, your word heals. For all those who are struggling physically, emotionally, spiritually, pour your love, your healing touch over them. May they experience the fullness that can come through you. Jesus, you have the power to overcome evil and to cast out demons. And yet in this world, evil still exists and we are working against it on a daily basis. We know that you are with us and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can overcome the evils in this world, the demons that continue to exist. And through sharing that love with others, they can experience what a world might be like without either of those being present. Jesus, the human one, God's son, you came to fulfill the law and to show us a new way. As we pray to you this morning, we know that our words are heard. And we know that those prayers that we have inside that we need to share are also heard by you, even as we say them all at the same moment. Jesus, our Redeemer, you came into this world to save the world and you came to save us. We give you thanks for that gift and as we enter into the season of Lent, may we take time to understand what that sacrifice, what that gift meant as we move towards the resurrection and Easter Sunday. Jesus, you are our friend. And as your followers, we welcome others. We encourage others. We seek out others so that we can share with them who you are as we understand it and what a difference you can make in the lives of everyone. And we know that when the disciples were with you, that they had many questions as we do. They couldn't see the entire mystery of who you were but they did know that you could show them a way and they came to you and they said Jesus tell us how should we pray and you taught them to pray as this saying our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing song this morning is going to make you want to rock it out. It's 10,000 Reasons, Bless the Lord.
clap. Amen. That was amazing. For those of you who are online, hopefully you can hear me. I'm going to be at the church until noon if you want to pick up one of the Impact Kids uh, Mardi Gras and Lenten kits. So you can come to the church. I'll be here till noon. And uh, to all of you in the room, please grab those as you're leaving. Uh, remember, this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, noon to one, drive through. And then at seven o'clock, we'll have a worship service. I want to close us with these words from Nathan Nettleton. Go now and speak of what you have seen of God's glory. Do not cling to holy moments when heaven overshadows you. But as the Lord lives, listen to Christ and follow him from the places of revelation to the places of mission. And may God shine the light of glory into your hearts. May Christ be with you and never leave you. And may the Spirit renew the image of God within you. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Bill.